winding down. So we might just kick off. Um, and just first of all, always wanting to um, centre ourselves in the knowledge that where we are right now is on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, who are, or where I am now, and I want to acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of the land where I am um, speaking from today and uh, encourage anybody to share the uh, country where they're also working from today in the chat box. I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal people as the um, traditional owners of the land and um, waters where we meet. Um, and so thanks everyone for coming into this webinar and um, coming to have a look at this walkthrough. I just wanted to quickly frame up how this will kind of flow today. Um, so first of all, I'm going to be handing over to Carmen Harris and Carmen has been the, um, the project lead with Turning Point. So um, if, if you're not aware, Turning Point was funded to do this piece of work. So Carmen has been leading that with Vic Manning. And then, um, so Carmen will, will give a little bit of information about the background and how this work was approached and how we came to be where we are now. And then Carmen will hand over to me and I'll actually share my screen and I'm just going to literally go through both the intake and the comprehensive assessment. And I've just highlighted on the draft of the tools, I've, I've just highlighted where there's been a change or an addition. And I'm just gonna literally step everybody through. Because we now have had to switch to webinar mode because of the numbers of participants that registered, um, what I might do is you can put questions if you've got questions along the way as I go through it into the chat box and I'll just keep pausing and having a look there. Um, and Carmen, you, you know, if you wanted to do that as well, if you wanted to kind of just bump me and kind of make me stop and I can answer questions along the way, but I will just kind of um, pause between the intake and comprehensive assessment just so people can uh, ask questions. And if anybody does want to speak, you can put your hand up at that point and I can unmute you as well. After we've done that, then um, we will have time for questions. And we've got Amanda Mason from the Department of Health here as well, who's also um, going to be able to answer questions. And then we're just going to talk about some next steps uh, as well. Um, so how this is going to be, how the changes are going to be communicated. And also we really, whether it be today or after, we'd really like feedback about capacity building around making sure that everybody feels that they have everything they need to be able to use the new elements in the screeners as well. So we really would like your feedback. And, pro, and, and into the future, VADA will be doing um, some surveying to keep gathering data about how the changes are impacting the work and the clients and the clinicians, and then what other things we might need to be doing to make sure that the sector is supported and ongoing. Just having a look at the chat because a few things just came in. Copies of the new forms available at this point. And hello everyone. Yes, hi Rob. Uh, no, not yet. So they haven't been uh, released yet. And so what's happening right now, I'm jumping ahead, but what's happening right now is there's work being done on the clinician guide to make sure that everything in the clinician guide supports the changes. So that's where this piece of work is at now. Okay. Uh, and what have, I've just got one more. In Marum, there is a family violence screener. Yes, yeah, so I might come back to that one because that, so Andrea, is it? Yeah, so I might just come back to that question because it's kind of moving forward. We're gonna get to that. So I will hand over to you now, Carmen. Thanks. Thanks, Sheridan. Um, thanks everybody for having me here today. My name is Carmen Harris. I'm the Service Development Manager for Statewide Services, which is part of Eastern Health and comprises Turning Point and Spectrum. Uh, I've also been uh, working under the oversight of Victoria Manning, our Head of Research and Workforce Development, as uh, Sheridan mentioned before. Uh, so, uh, I guess a little bit of background to uh, this project is that last year we were engaged by DHS to align the tools to the Marum framework uh, and also uh, the, the clinician's guide and there's a, there's a sort of a, a basic e-learning package that's also available on the tools that's not replacing Marum brief and intermediate training, that's literally sort of what the tools are, how they're used um, and, and so that needs to be updated as well. Um, so, as Sheridan's mentioned, we're going we're gonna to walk through the changes today and, and it's important to remember that these changes are 
uh, for victim survivors only at this point, uh, and that the level uh, prescribed for AOD agencies is brief and intermediate. So that's the training that we've all got to get to if we're clinicians. Um, there may be uh, some uh, anomalies, I guess, or differences in uh, admin workers, reception workers, and peer workers. So your agency might have a different level of expertise for them around MARAM, um, but that is sort of uh, within the agency's um, approach to it. Uh, also, the changes include reference to the Family Violence Information Sharing Scheme and the Child Information Sharing Scheme, which is really part of that linked up. Um, multi-agency part of the multi-agency risk assessment and management framework, which is MARAM. Um, we know that MARAM is established under law and that now we all have to check for family violence routinely. Um, that may have been something that was already happening. So it's not to say that you weren't already doing that. Uh, it's just that we're aligning to this best practice framework. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we're looking at screening identification, if necessary, risk assessment and safety planning for family violence. And a good comparison is uh, alignment to uh, risk assessment and management around suicide risk, um, which we've all had to sort of upskill in. And, and this is a similar uh, kind of initiative. Um, so we're lucky in the AOD sector because we have standardised intake and assessment tools, which means that um, by aligning these tools to the MARAM framework, we're actually kind of aligning the entire Victorian sector uh, and agencies, I guess, have some certainty and some consistency in how it's approached. So um, it helps us to all sort of look at our agencies and go, well, we, we need to support staff in, in these areas and in these ways. Um, so we are all doing it together. And there's also, I guess, an acknowledgement that we all work in different contexts. Uh, for example, uh, some AOD services may have family violence services on site uh, and others won't. Uh, some may have uh, a, a lot of experience and may have been well progressed in their MARAM implementation and others might not be. Um, but we'll all now be doing this uh, together. So through those forms, we've tried to, uh, I guess, cater for a range of different needs, including um, where people aren't uh, super experienced by putting some prompts and supportive um, referral pathways in there as well. Um, so we've run a very inclusive consultation process. It's been um, fantastically um, attended, engaged. The working group is quite big uh, and it includes uh, staff that work in intake and assessment roles, uh, operational managers, uh, rural and regional providers, uh, AOD specialist family violence advisors, quite a number of those. Uh, and funders at DHS, uh, subject matter experts from a range of specialist family violence services, including Family Safety Victoria, Nota Violence and more. Um, and the input that we've received was uh, extensive. It's a very high quality. Um, we we uh, feel like the this has informed the tools holistically as well. So we've, we've taken opportunities to update other aspects of the form through this, uh, including um, people will be happy to hear the fillable forms having more space to write, which was one of the, the um, bits of feedback we got back that we were able to implement as part of this as well. So that was pretty cool. Um, so uh, the I guess what's happened around that is uh, we've also put the clinician's guide out through the working group. Um, and through that process, we actually got a lot more feedback on the tools. Um, we weren't going to implement any more feedback around the tools, but the feedback was, as I said, of such a high quality that we decided to implement nearly everything that came through um, the working group and, and various other avenues as well. Um, so, importantly, and my, um, my little pet part that I'm very proud of is that we actually got consumers to review the tools and uh, they were consumers with a, a lived experience of family violence and AOD. Uh, and that was a process that was, uh, I guess, put together by SHARC, the Self-Help Addiction uh, Resource Centre. And um, Self-Help Addiction Resource Centre, I think I said it right. Uh, and Odyssey actually facilitated it through their consumers. Um, so that feedback was incorporated into the clinician's guide and the e-learning package, but we didn't have to change the, the tools because consumers were uh, quite okay with them and how they were put together and what was asked. Um, 
you know, the, some really uh, great feedback around how we ask those things. And we know that uh, we don't want to sit there and robotically ask these questions, but um, Sheridan will uh, tackle the clinical aspects uh, on the walkthrough. Uh, and also um, we've left uh, a, a lot more time for questions uh, than we have when we've looked, we've talked to the CEOs and managers via Vada. Um, we've really tried to leave a lot more time for you guys to ask questions because there are a lot of questions there, which we've put back out, but um, we wanted to give you a chance to, I guess, yeah, just nut it all out. Um, so the next stage of this project is that actually about implementing the, the perpetrator tools. Um, and that's uh, coming down the line, I guess, after we've sort of implemented this part, bedded this down, we've got another opportunity to actually review what we've done so um, as Sheridan was saying around feedback, now we also welcome your feedback going forward too. And we can collect that and incorporate that into our next review, um, even if it is about how we've implemented victim survivor um, aspects. Um, so my, uh, my big encouragement to you and your organisation is just uh, get ready by going to training. Uh, ask your organisation about what supports are available for you. Uh, think about uh, your secondary consultation options in your area and also the specialist family violence advisors for AOD, which there is one assigned to every catchment area. Um, they're also a resource source for you, uh, but also your organisation will have guidance and, and that's where you, you need to sort of be asking them about um, their approach to this as well, um, around uh, the information sharing schemes, etc. as well. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, uh, very pleased that we've been able to um, to get this work sort of to this point where the tools are ready to go and um, pulling together the last little bits uh, around the e-learning package and the clinician's guide now uh, and look forward to answering any questions you might have later. Um, just looking in the chat now and uh, I don't see anything that I can answer right now. Yeah, okay, um, so I'll hand back over to Sheridan who's going to walk us through the tools. Thanks, Carmen. Um, and yeah, Carmen just brought up a, a good point, just if, if people weren't aware that the at the CEO and managers meeting, they received this walkthrough. So we, we showed them first so that they could and kind of started that conversation about that, you know, that they have to start to look at what, you know, looking at what it is that they will need in their, so in terms of policies and procedures, um, and which really is, you know, what MARAM alignment is about, MARAM embedding and alignment, and, um, and also obviously looking at what is it going to look like for their staff and, and also if there's any kind of capacity building needs. So we've put that to them. Um, sorry, I'm just... My eye is just being taken down to the chat box. Yep, great. I think it's the key that the AOD tools and clinician guide is applied in partnership with organisational policies and procedures too. Exactly. We've had a lot of conversations about that, which is why we've kind of gone backwards and forwards with some people seeing, uh, some people within the working group wanting things in the clinician guides to be very, very prescriptive. But what we also know, of course, yes, that it also needs to align with the policies and procedures in the organisation and that agencies need to take responsibility for that as well. So it's a good point. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, hopefully I'll be able to do this. Sometimes it plays up on me. Um, and Carmen, just, Carmen or Amanda, just let me know, because I know sometimes people can't read it. Can you, is that big enough for you to be able to see? That looks good to me, Sheridan. Beautiful. Okay, and I won't be able to see the chat box, by the way, while while I'm in share screen view. So just so everybody knows, I won't be able to see what you're what you're saying there until I un unshare my screen. So we're just literally going to walk through this, and so this is the um, starting at the beginning of the the way that a client uh, experiences the process is the intake tool, um, and so. I've highlighted the parts where there were changes in any way. The first thing that we've changed is really, you know, some of these are not going to seem like they're uh, specifically to do with family violence or within the Marum framework, but I'm just going to highlight them now so everyone's aware. So we've just changed the, in terms of, first of all, best practice, we've changed this to does the person identify as LGBTIQA plus 
So we know that it's not just uh, as you know in individual identifiers, but we also know that it's um, people who belong to a certain community as well. This is just considered best practice. But the other thing about this, this is that what we're doing too is we're looking to expand those areas of intersectionality so that as we're working with our clients, we get an understanding of you know, any other interlocking oppression that maybe they experience. Um, and so in terms of family violence, what we know from the data is that intersectionality plays a really big part because we know people who use uh, power and control against another person will, um, will use things that they're areas that they're discriminated against or where they experience oppression, they'll use tactics that include that. So, um, so we want to make sure as much as possible, there's just an opportunity for us to understand those areas of intersectionality for our clients. So making sure that this is um, more understandable, it's clearer than what it previously was. Um, and we've still got, you know, yes, no, prefer not to say or other, because the other thing, of course, we had Previously, um, it was L and G and B. And so what we know is that this is obviously an expanding term as well. So it's expanding acronym. There will be, you know, other letters that don't fit in there that, that people will want to, um, you know, that they identify with. And so you can kind of write that in there. Um, this came out through the working group that while we're in here, people wanted it to be brought up. Uh, they wanted to have private health insurance. I'm not sure why, to be honest, I can't remember, but it was put forward. So it's there on the intake if somebody wants to share that. Um, person with a disability has come up front as well in the same way that we're expanding on uh, intersectionality for when we used LGBTIQA+, we also have a person with a disability for the same reasons. Um, and the working group asked if we could just move while we're in, in here and making changes, could we just move reason for call um, up to the top because it was apparently people were clinicians were telling us that it was a better way to kind of start conversations to have that prompt up front. We've now changed this. We had permission to send mail to address. We've just changed it just to remind people to ask, is it safe to send mail to your address? And again, you know, it's just expanding our, our ability to be able to identify if somebody is is not safe at home or is experiencing power and control in a relationship by just talking about safety upfront. Um, preferred contact methods, so maybe they have, they'll tell us their address. We might ask them, is it safe to send mail to, to that address? And they might say no, which would be a really great invitation then to ask about what's going on at home. Um, and then we've got a preferred contact method is it safe to leave a voicemail? So we've just increased that conversation around safety just to ask, to give us the opportunity to ask those nice open-ended questions around or clarifying questions about what, you know, what is happening for you. Um, and, and then also if, um, if there's somebody else that's got access to the phone or there's an emergency contact, we're just gonna ask, sorry, it's in line with the emergency contact, the relationship to the client. So this is all just about expanding our view of, you know, if there's any, um, you know, dynamics in the relationships or if the person's not safe at home. In terms of, um, again, increasing our understanding of intersectionality for our client, we've got visa status here, um, just because we know that you know, there's cohorts of uh, people, particularly women who are on um, visas, um, who don't have permanent residency yet, uh, are very vulnerable um, in family violence. So we know that there is a particular cohort so we've just added that there just, just, just to kind of expand our view of um, that for our clients. Um, I'm not sure, actually I've highlighted that, sorry, but I think that's an error, that's, that was already there. We've added here when, we've, when we're asking about children in care, we've added other changes to parenting, arraignment, uh, parenting arrangement or parenting orders. This is just a prompt that will help us to hear if there's been a recent separation uh, or, you know, separation, you know, in recent times, um, because as we know, um, separation, if, if the person is experiencing family violence, then we know that if they've separated, that that's a time of increased risk. So it just helps us to hear if that's present. Um, and obviously these prompts will just help to tell the story. Um, and then down the bottom where we've got some um, uh, other services, if we've heard that the person is uh, already engaged with the family violence service, 
or if they're engaged with the men's behaviour change program, it would be great to hear that there. So we've just added those boxes there. Where we've just added here around risky drug practices, we've added injected by another. That's just to increase our scope of being able to hear if they're being injected by another without choice. So that's about um, uh, drug use coercion as well. So coercion using um, substances. And again, this is another one of those questions that just got um, brought into the group because um, while we're in here. So um, can I just check, you can definitely hear me because my, my computer is popping up saying my internet connection is unstable. Everything. We can hear you Sheridan. There's a few times where it goes a bit slow and then speeds up, but yep. Okay, all right. Yeah, got that robot kind of voice going on probably. Um, are you taking any medications for your mental health was was not specifically around um, family violence. It was actually a question that um, some clinicians brought into the working group and said they wanted in there while we were making changes. Um, now, where we go down here, so we've got, um, we've added, added a question about whether the person has a, has a current family violence intervention order. Um, this was actually, you know, one of the things we're really aware of is that the brief to turning point was that they needed to just align with victim survivor guidelines and tools. And so what we know obviously is that perpetrators will, uh, you know, one of their um, tactics is to identify themselves as a victim. And so it can be really, really complex work when we have somebody who we think maybe is actually using parent control but will identify as a victim. So we've tried to think about ways that while we're not trying to increase the perpetrator work within the intake and comprehensive assessment, we do also want to find ways to help tease out and help the clinician to be able to, to just be able to make that assessment. And so um, the current, putting a current family violence intervention order just is one of those kind of strategies about helping somebody here, um, you know, if somebody is really a, a victim survivor is, or they are somebody who's a user of family violence. So you've, we've got here, you know, do you, do you have a current family violence intervention order? Um, if they say yes, you're going to ask that are they the is it are they the affected family member or are they the respondent? So if they are the affected family member, then they are the victim. They have been identified as the victim survivor. If they're respondent, they've been identified as the user of violence. And then just to increase our ability to hear and um, keep children in view, we're also asking if children are listed on that family violence intervention order. Um, and then we're asking what are the details that are on, on the family violence intervention order as well. So if we can hear that the person can't, you know, can't approach their ex-partner, we'll hear that if they can't have access to their children. So any of those details that get put onto an intervention order, we're starting to hear what's going on for them. Um, and we may also hear there's just, this one is just a prompt. So throughout, you know, from asking these kinds of prompts or some of the others, or they might've just disclosed throughout the intake, you may have the opportunity to hear other kinds of things that have gone on as well. And so, you, you know, that would fall into the category of family violence, you're gonna list them there. So even if the, you know, you've asked the question and the person has said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, like my ex-partner took an intervention order out of me and they might tell you a bit of a story. They might, you know, they've disclosed something. So you might just put some um, notes there so that they'll be um, handed on when they go through to assessment and treatment. Um, do you have any immediate concerns about your safety? Again, this is a question that we're really just asking, you know, to, to people who are victim survivors. Um, so if somebody's identified themselves as a, a user of violence, you know, you may need to make use your clinical judgment there about whether you ask that question in this way or not. Um, but this is really about, you know, assessing if somebody is safe today. Um, and if they have any immediate concerns about safety, then we've got a little note under here. If you are concerned about the immediate safety of the client, you know, if they've said they're not safe today, or if they've said, you know, they're not safe when they go home today, um, then you really need to have some sort of action so whether, you know, escalating to your supervisor, calling safe steps to get a secondary consultation, or if you hear that it's crime, 
or you know, or serious uh, risk, then you also you, know, you may engage police. These are the common steps, but again, you will need to have a plan and have a, a process within your organisations. Um, we just added family violence here. So the justification for prioritisation, if you hear family violence is in the mix, it escalates the uh, priority for treatment. You, you know, you can, that's obviously one of the reasons you might, you might want to escalate as well. Um, and then down here, as we move on, you're going to, if you have identified or the person's disclosed that they're experiencing family violence as a victim, then you really want the, to flag that the, when the comprehensive assessment is done, that a risk assessment should be done. So we have the, um, the brief risk assessment tool the, and the MARAM intermediate risk assessment tool, which are the levels of risk assessing that are, are the responsibilities for this sector. So that would be what you're flagging for the, for the next clinician to do. Um, we've just added family violence there, which makes set, you know, sense in terms of next steps. And that is all of the changes to the intake tool. I'm going to stop sharing and just check because I could see some things coming up. Uh, and I do, I did see a hand go up, I think, but now I can't see it anymore. Sheridan, there's a question in there about why we're asking for private health insurance when we offer services for, for no charge. And I actually do know the reason, so I thought I might bump in. Um, the, reason, the reason was that um, some clients may have private health insurance, and if they do, it can actually fast track their access into residential services. So that was the reason that that was put on there and I believe that was that came from CoHealth but don't quote me but um, that was around if they do have that option they could probably you know avoid the wait list that we see in the public sector. And I'm just going to address a quick the, the I can see one question at the bottom I'm sorry I can't read your name it's just cutting your name off um, FSV perpetrator tool guidance will use the language person using violence rather than perpetrator at a practice level. We'll absolutely be changing the languaging in line with that. And it's just, uh, it's maturity model. It's just still rolling. It's still uh, a bit of a work in progress at the moment, but perpetrator, what we'll, what we'll typically see, and we're gonna do some comms around this as well once things are really clear, just that perpetrator is, is easy to use in, in policy um, and, and in other kinds of, um, you know, written kind of um, documentation, we can use that, but but we would never use that word with that client. We would never talk to them. I mean, I don't think that anybody does anyway, um, but I think that in terms of, you know, throughout the practice guides and and throughout these tools and the, clini and the clinician guide, it was something we looked at in the clinician guide as well, is that it'll be the word, the wording will be person who uses family violence and so that's just represents a, you know, a change in the ways that we kind of speak about, about the issue. Um, mm, 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 mm. I'm just seeing Leanne saying, will it be possible for us to get a copy of the new forms for us to review before the clinician's guide is updated? Does that, I'm not sure if you mean that a copy of the tools or a copy of the clinician guide. Um, I think it's the new forms, Sheridan. So. It, I think it's can we release the intake and assessment forms to review before the clinician guides updated? Um, Amanda, what's your view on that? <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I think, given the considerable uh, feedback and, and input from the working group to get the tools to where they are now and the mm -hmm. level of endorsement. Um, it would be sort of with the view of, perhaps correct me if I'm, I'm correct, if I'm, if I need to be corrected here, Carmen, it would be not so much for, it would, for information rather than consultation or yeah. changing yeah. any changes. Yeah. Reluctant to say, but, but given the, the amount of consultation work that's gone into developing the tools at the moment yeah. to reflect Marum, yeah. I would be reluctant to sort of delay there. Um, release 
by gathering further input and th this group, this clinician group, your input is obviously incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. So feel free to provide any input now during this meeting on the on the tools. Um, but yeah, that, that I think you were, correct me if I'm wrong, Carmen, adequately sort of represented on the working. Yeah, group. so we'd be so, okay with sharing them, but not making any further changes is the answer. We wouldn't mind sharing them with agencies so they could have a look but we wouldn't be taking any more changes. Is that about right? What do you think and what, is the, what does the group think really? Sheridan, feel free to chime in. I think where we're at right now is with the, that I think we were releasing them, but yeah, we can definitely, I think we should be sending everybody a copy before they're needing to work with them. So mm -hmm. that, that I definitely think we should be doing that. And so that people can start to look at them and, and, and start to, you know, talk through what they need and if they, you know, and, and work through them with their specialist family violence advisors and things like that. Um, mm, so it's but, more information and preparation. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to have to see some of these questions. Um, okay. So Joanna, you're asking about, can you expand on visa status? Specifically, it's really, I mean, there's different kinds of visas, but specifically around spousal visas is an area of um, vulnerability. So, um, and that's why I was saying like, particularly women, this is a, a, an area of vulnerability um, where women uh, come, come over and they're on spousal visas and they might have children here. And um, to understand the nuance of that, because we, we know that they are, um, you know, the tactics around having them sent back, the ways that perpetrators can do that. I mean, they don't have access to things like Medicare. They, they can't work. You know, there's a lot of different barriers for them. So just understanding if they're on a, a spousal visa so we can listen out for if there's any of those identifiers of parent control in their relationship um, just because they are a vulnerable group. And it's an area a, a lot of them, you know, may have seen, will have uh, English as a second language a lot of times, things like that. So they do experience a lot of barriers um, and the, those can be used as tactics against them um, and specifically if they have children as well so that they can have their children removed, things like that. There's just a lot of ways that um, we know that the violence can have tactics against them. So just trying to expand our view of them. Um, is there an option to omit gender bias behaviour change programs to just the visit? I suppose the thing is eventually it will look different. The languaging around this will look different. And, but right now what we're just trying to, do, it, it's just a, it's a name right now. So I suppose what we've done is, I mean, it's, it's possible to just put behavior change programs. I think what we've done is put the name just to, because it's called that right now, but I agree it will, it will change in the future, Brendan. Um, and we know that there's different kinds of programs like for, um, at Drummond Street, you know, actually they're sort of changing right now, but yeah, there are, there are different behavior change programs for different genders. And I think we were just writing the name of the one that's now, but yeah, I suppose it would still make sense. People would probably still understand what it is. So it's a, it's a good point. We might look at, um, I might make a note of that for when we're doing other changes later in the year. Um, um, Sheridan, it looks like there might be a little bit of confusion here. Uh, should it not be the level of danger the person is in that de that determines for determinators uh, determines their fast tracking rather than their ability to pay? Um, that was in regard to AOD services, not uh, uh, and and obviously risk is an aspect in prioritising people for access to services too. Um, but this was about AOD services, residential services, wait lists that I was talking about before. Yeah, so that's got two, two things confused of it. Yeah. Um, I am just having a scan down. Uh, thanks, Joy. Uh, um, I noticed there's one there about intake done via AXO for forensic clients. So yes, it is a different intake process for forensic clients and I'm not privy to uh, whether their intake uh, processes have been aligned to Marum, so I'm not sure. Um, you'll still be able to access the forms 
uh, to have a look at those because they'll be on the um, the websites uh, where the where they are currently. So they'll be updated in all those uh, locations. Absolutely. So you can have a look. And I think what there. Deb might be referring to there, Carmen, um, is AXO do the regional intakes as well. So they conduct a, the forensic intake service plus the regional regular intake service. So um, they will be using your AXO regional intake providers. They will be using these tools, these new updated tools. Um, and like Carmen said, they'll be published on the on the website. Great, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Wendy, I can see you've asked a question, but I'm really just sorry, I'm not sure what you're saying. So you might, if you wanted to type it again, updated victim survivor content could come in line with the perpetrator content, even that is still in train. Sorry, I'm just not really understanding your question. So if you want to retype it or put up your hand and I'll unmute you, um, you can do that. Sorry about that. It's not, not understanding. Hang on a sec. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Sorry about the cryptic message. Um, I was trying to be clever and concise. What I mean is that um, some folk are wondering whether um, any additional changes to the tools in their current form that takes a victim survivor focus, if there's more um, feedback that could be received, and obviously that's not possible right now. But given that um, the tools will undergo another reshaping as the perpetrator tools become more available, it, will there be time, will there be an opportunity for AOD sector to feed back and tweak any of these changes that are about to be um, uh, launched? Does, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, Wendy, absolutely. I think that um, we're doing our very best to do the very best and most comprehensive job we can this time. And, and as Amanda was saying, the feedback rounds were actually extended quite significantly to take on further feedback. We've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Um, but what we've got is a, an interesting uh, sort of silver lining in that the perpetrator tools coming in a bit later, you know, may not be ideal, but what it does do is gives us an opportunity to review what we've done this time and absolutely um, able to tweak it, improve it, um, respond to, you know, I guess that use when the rubber hits the road to, um, you know, how's it all working on the ground as well. And I think that that's um, the other thing to note is, you know, recording your your MARAM work in VADC is really important as well um, because uh, we, we, that's how we'll be able to, well, how DHS will be able to see uh, how much, we're actually using the MARAM and how much activity there's been since um, this change is implemented. So that's how we'll be tracking, um, that's how they'll be tracking that. So yeah, thanks. So thanks. absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. I just um, I just thought folk could find that really uh, reassuring, that's all. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, really great question. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the reasons that VADA wants to also do surveying is because we want to hear the experiences as well. Um, so we'll be, we'll be setting that, that up as well. Um, and I think, what was the other question I just saw? I can't read the names, I'm sorry. Can we consider asking for all medications in addition to mental health medications at intake? I think the thing is too, like, because a lot of these are prompts at intake, I think what I hear is that clinicians are doing that already there's, they're asking for, you know, current medications, tell me a little bit of, you know, what medications you're currently on and then furthering, uh, you know, what medication and hearing what they take and then clarifying, uh, you know, so those are for your, for mental health and the, these are for this. Um, so I think that's going on. So you can always do that. I know that's a part of the practice. Um, so I think I've answered most of the questions. Uh, Hang on, may have missed it, but a note around elder abuse as well. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so we have specific tools and guidelines coming out about, I mean, I don't know if you want to speak to this, Amanda, but the, the, there are specific uh, tools and guidelines around elder abuse as well. Um, and that we've not specifically done that work, but doesn't mean that you won't hear that. You know, obviously you will, you hear that already in your um, work when, when that is happening. But Amanda, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? No, nope, nothing else to add to uh, add to that apart from the MARAM does incorporate 
elder abuse, all kinds of family violence, including elder abuse as well. So the framework um, will certainly have advice on that. And that's where your organisation's policies and procedures come in. I mean, there'll be differences around adolescence as well. Um, I know at Eastern Health, we have a, a family violence policy that covers elder abuse as well. So yeah, there, there should be organisational guidance around, around that as well, including working with perpetrators at the moment too, and what the guidance is for that, given that that's not part of this alignment. So your org should be able to give you guidance, your seniors and your team leaders, et cetera, and point you to the right uh, documentation. And, um, and yeah, and so Mary's just asked, how do you envisage centralised intake to work with those at risk before referring to external services? I mean, it's a good question. And we think that there will be different, slightly different responses with different organisations, but the best practice would be if the person is hearing, if the intake worker is hearing that there is, uh, if there are, you know, either there's disclosure or there are many identifiers of family violence present that they would also do um, a risk assessment with that person. So they, they'd actually be able to do the brief what we think probably the brief risk assessment um, and to be able to assess whether the person is at elevated or imminent um, risk or immediate risk. Um, and, but otherwise you, you're kind of making an assessment about whether the person, you know, can having all of that flag, which is why you've got that section that says, um, you know, the prompt for the, what needs to happen next is a risk assessment needs to happen next. So if you've, um, being able to hear identifiers from the client of family violence and so you've done that level of screening then you you want the um, person to go through and have a risk assessment done when they go through to have their comprehensive assessment um, yeah. but where they may get disclosures or hear really high risk indicators once you start un unpacking and opening that up and so you you are going to need to obviously do um, mm. you know put a focus on if there's high level family violence at play and you're at that intake level, you are going to have to stop and do the, the, the risk assessment with them on the phone if, if possible at that time. Um, the, the working group actually um, mentioned that most of the time um, risk is flagged at intake for the assessor. So we'd, we'd, we'd sort of do it in line with other risk management where you know, if you notice that there's really concerning risk or high risk, like Sheridan was saying, that you'd, you'd stop and deal with it as you would with suicide risk. Um, but, but that generally the practice at intake is to flag risk for assessment or make a referral. So it's, it's sort of about, if you think about it in line with the way you manage other risks, I think that that's a pretty good way of thinking about it because we know that the intake is a very brief 20-minute uh, type of um, interaction with the client. It's obvious, sometimes it's a conversation. You might not go through the intake form verbatim either. You might sort of fill it out based on a conversation and you integrate your risk assessment. The idea is that we routinely screen, that we have um, you know, screeners and prompts in it that help you to know sort of what the, the minimum level is. And, and that's sort of what we've done with the intake form. But as Sheridan said, just like any other risk, if you sort of, if you're concerned or it's looking like it's a higher risk situation, then, you know, we would deal with it, manage the risk and um, record that in case notes as well. And you put in for, well, it would be up to your organisation, but you'd probably put in for a brief intervention if you were going to stop and do a risk assessment because you've heard, you know, identifiers and, and high risk indicators of family violence and you, you'd put in for um, a brief intervention for yeah, is, that work as well. Yeah, which is up to three hours of support. So that's... that's um, gives you a bit of um, room to do those things. Okay, so I'm, I think I've answered all the questions there. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen for the comprehensive. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. And you probably, probably no surprises, this is where most of the work is done because obviously most of the time you're face-to-face, -face, uh, you have more time. Uh, and you, know, you have the ability to do a, a deeper level assessment. So the first thing we've changed is on the very first kind of page that, that lists all the optional modules. Optional module is, um, is now obsolete. 
it's actually been obsolete for a while. It wasn't really, uh, it was quite old um, and hadn't really been updated. So um, all of optional module 10, I mean, the first thing to say is it's no longer really considered an optional module. It's obviously legislated that we use MARAM. So the wording even didn't really make sense, but um, there are gonna be links, hyperlinks here to take you through to all of the MARAM tools and practice guides for victim survivors. So that's, that's there. And then there's a list and these are all hyperlinked as well through to each of these individual practice guides and tools. And it says for victim survivors only at this stage. So obviously that will change later in the year when the, when the next revision is being done. So all of the different tools, so the screening tool, a basic safety plan, the brief risk assessment tool and the intermediate risk assessment tool and the child victim survivor risk assessment tool are all linked there. Um, and so obviously as we go through your audit and do that, uh, obviously they are you know, standardised screeners, validated tools so that nothing's been touched in there. And your psychosocial section is exactly the same. Um, and so where we've changed is just down here in section 2C. We just have, again, to increase the visibility of children and see them as victims in their own right, which is a, you know, obviously an aspect of Marum. Um, we just have put a prompt in here about if there's any DHHS involvement, or child protection involvement, and if so, you can, could we get the name of the worker and the contact details of where, where they work, and also um, making sure we capture the child's name and date of birth. Uh, and that's really mostly around being able to share information um, or if information was, was requested of us, but if under the information sharing scheme, the, um, we wanted to share information about a child that we um, have assessed as being at risk, then we, we could do that or we could request information as well. And um, we've added a prompt here around housing. Have you ever been forced out of housing by your partner or a family member? There's just a prompt here saying victim survivors only just to help the clinician remember that's really what, what this question is aimed at, is to hear if somebody's been um, forced out of, out of their home by a family member um, or, uh, or a partner. Have you ever needed to stay in emergency housing or refuge? It's a similar thing. So it's just expanding our ability to hear if somebody you know, has been... Um, been made homeless or forced out of their home or had to seek refuge, sorry, as well um, because of family violence. Um, and in finances, again, just to increase our scope to be able to hear identifiers of family violence, does anyone have access to your bank account or do they control your finances? So that's obviously about trying to hear for if there's any financial abuse or control present for that person. And again, we've just added um, into, and now of course, a lot of this may have come from your intake. So you taken information from intake and transferred it uh, directly across here. And in which case, if there is an intervention order, you might be able to just clarify the details of that order and have uh, a more extensive conversation with the person about that. But you're gonna ask them again, do you have family violence intervention orders? Are you, are you the affected family member or the respondent? Are there children? Um, and then we've added here, if there's been any breaches of family violence uh, intervention order there, either current or historical, and then details of the order. I mean, so we know that for people who use violence where there's been breaches in place, obviously that means that the uh, incident has escalated and, and when it's a breach, it becomes a criminal offence. So it just helps us to hear the, the risk that's present if there is any. And this is the section that's uh, the new section now, somebody did ask in the chat box before about whether doing the assessment, the, um, the Marum aligned assessment, would we, would we need to also still do the Marum screening? And so it's a good question, but so you know, this is, this is pretty much word for word, the Marum screening or an, a part of the Marum screening and identification tool. Um, and we went backwards and forwards in the working group about how best to do this and overwhelmingly the working group uh, believed that it would be more effective, uh, easier for the clinician, and also mean that the clinician would, would receive the, the right kind of training because there is the training on the screening and identification tool that will come out as an e-learning module um, in a few months' time. So this is the Marum Victim Survivor Screening and Identification Tool. Um, 
there's a tick box here to say if, if, if this was already done at intake, and then you've got a note in bold here before asking the following, check that the client feels safe to answer questions about family violence. That's obviously going to be done in different ways. If you're sitting with your client and they've had their partner is, is keeps bursting into the room or, you know, is aggressively saying they have to be there or is sitting there saying they're stupid, they don't know what they're talking, I have to talk for them. All these different stories that I hear that partners do, um, you wouldn't ask these questions. You would make sure that you found a way to come back or you'd make sure to find a way to uh, get the person on their own. But if it's not safe at that time, if you suspect it might not be safe, then you wouldn't ask the questions uh, in front of somebody and in the same way you're going to check in with them so you might flag these are questions that we ask of everybody you know in your preamble um, they are questions about family violence do you feel safe to answer these questions here today um, and so you'll do that little preamble to just check in on safety and so these are the questions that are in the marum screening and identification tool is there a partner or family member or members who, who does things that make you or your children feel unsafe and then examples of that, do they control your day-to-day -day activities? Do they physically hurt you or your children? Have they made threats to hurt you, you or your children in any way? And do you have concerns about your immediate safety? So you've got, these are screening questions to hear if the person is uh, experiencing family violence as a victim. And then this is about the, the um, levels of risk. So do you have concerns about your immediate safety? And do you and your children feel safe when you leave here today? And then you've got a details section. Um, and then you've got some notes here. If you're concerned about the immediate safety of your client, you want to escalate it to your supervisor. So it's similar to what's written in your intake. Uh, call safe steps. So that would be for a secondary consultation, or it might even be to, you know, if, if you get permission from the client, you might talk to them about using safe steps. So you might make a warm referral at that point. Or of course, if there's um, a crime, you know, then you may use the police as well. Again, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Just yeah, um, zoom in a little bit. I don't think you can see the chat, but Judith has asked, can you zoom in the document a little bit, make it a bit bigger? Is that better? Maybe yeah. a little bit okay, more. Cool. Is that better? Yep. Yeah, because if I go, uh, that's probably as big as I can get, yep. unfortunately. Yeah, that's cool. Great. I think that's good. So you can see, sorry, everyone, I didn't realize. So yeah, you can see the 2G section here. And I know I've just read it out, but now that maybe you couldn't see it, so I'll just let, I'll just pause on it for a sec. And so you've got some prompts here with the, um, you know, when when risk is identified, um, if family violence is disclosed or identified, use the Marum Intermediate Risk Assessment Tool to assess the level of risk. And then another prompt: if Marum Safety Plan or Marum uh, use the Marum Safety Plan. So we had that back up in your in the beginning section. There was a link to it. It's Appendix Four in the um, practice guides. Um, or there's a Marum Aligned Basic Safety uh, Safety Plan for Family Violence is on page is in Section Seven on page fifteen. So I'll show you that in a second. So there's just some supporting kind of um, guidance here. And again, you need to work within your organisations to understand who does what. I know some people talk about that if family violence is identified, then they would uh, assess risk with somebody else or with one of their special, with the specialist family violence advisor, things like that, they would seek support to assess risk. So really it's, you need to understand who does what in the same way, like Carmen said earlier, in the same way that we do with um, things like suicide. So I'll just move down. You can see none of that has changed, all of the uh, medical, the mental uh, health section has not changed. Mental state and prescribed medications. And so this is where it changes. And where we used to have section six uh, was just called risk. Now we've just kind of separated them out. So section six is now suicide and self-harm risk specifically. So that we're just focused on suicide and self-harm and as the risk has, um, the risk and safety plan for that. Uh, Carmen just picked up that this was one that is a is not was not on here. So we've just added that while we had the opportunity to add that that referral and phone number. 
And so now we've got suicide line Victoria is actually professional counsellors, which why that was why that was added. Beautiful, thank you. And so now we've got section seven that comes up to section six, and it is a, a marum, it's a it's sorry, not a marum, it's a safety plan for family violence. Um, and while it's not a marum tool, it is marum aligned. Um, and really this is, um, you can see it says here, marum risk assessment and management tools and practice guides are also available, including a marum safety plan, just to prompt you. Um, and, but this is a basic marum aligned safety plan with a range of different referral options. Um, and just some guidance in the top here. Um, this template is to support and guide your safety planning with victim survivors of family violence. It should be led by the victim survivors as the evidence shows that they're the best predictors of their own risk. Safety planning is not static, it's not a static process and any or all safety plans need to be reviewed for effectiveness as the elements of risk and circumstance change. And there's a note here, it may not be safe for the client to take a copy of this plan with them, record details of this plan for handover and monitoring on page 16. So that's obviously when you're um, the final case summary, you're going to um, put, put the elements of this into there as well. Um, and really, this is just, it's a one page guidance. Any of you who have done the safety planning training with me previously, um, this looks like what I write on a whiteboard. So you've got what are the protective effects? So that prompt on what's currently working to keep you and your kids safe is kind of one of those questions you might ask. What's what's really what's working for you? And so just asking that open question to make sure you hear what's already working and make sure that you kind of um, look at whether we can work in with any of that or whether it's just good for us to know know what those are and who are their safe people. And then there's just these prompts. Again, none of this is tick box. None of this, you don't, you know, you will ask and open up this line of questioning and, and this dialogue in whatever ways, you know, is comfortable for you and the client. But these are prompts to think about. So what resources do they have? Do they have cash and phone and a spare SIM? Do they have Mikey cards? Um, do they know where their important documents are and their scripts um, and, and the, for important medications? Who are the safe people in the, in, in the in their life that they can they know can support them at this point in time? Who else do they need to consider on their safety plan? So children, pets, things like that. Um, how would you get to safety if you needed to leave your home quickly? Obviously, safety planning is never about the leaving, it's always about what's happening right now and leaving can be uh, an option on a safety plan or it might not be right now. Uh, where, if you needed to leave, where could you go that's safe? So if something escalated um, and you needed to get, get away quickly, is there somewhere you know you could go to be safe? And is there a time if you did need to leave, are there certain kind of times where you know that, um, or even like are there certain times when you know that your risk really escalates? Um, is, safe, is tech safety required? So does, you know, talking to our clients about do they know how to turn off find my phone if they've got an iPhone? Do they know how to change social media settings, things like that? So do they know that, you know, um, how to access a safe computer and safe internet? So can we talk? So having those conversations obviously is, all, is about planning for them to be safe. Um, and then there's some options for crisis intervention. So we've obviously got safe steps, which is your 24 seven, um, you know, crisis response, statewide crisis response, which will also, you know, you can also get secondary consult from them as well. And you've got your sexual assault crisis line, triple zero, just put a, um, obviously a little flag, victim survivors, especially rural clients, they may not choose to use the police because the police may be engaged with with the, the person who's using violence against them and things like that. So we just need to make sure that we remember that they're the best predictors of their risk and they have to lead this process. Um, and then some other just referral needs. So the specialist family violence service in your area, 1-800-RESPECT, of course, again, is a 24-7 number, which is, so, so it's a good option that's trained counsellors and they will also make referrals into, into crisis services as well. Um, the Orange Door, if you've got one in your area, are there other culturally specific um, services? Um, and so, you know, there's just a few options just to help your thinking while you're doing safety planning. It, existing supports and also if there's a consent to, to contact other people to, to get risk relevant information. And then if there's anything you're going to do to follow up, you know, this is just to keep us accountable as well. Um, and if there's permission to share information, I mean, that could even just be you might talk to the 
client about within in this team we work together as a team and I really want to share your information with my supervisor you know it could even just be things like that um, and then your final case summary we've now brought in those new aspects here to make sure that they're all recorded um, as the person moves on to treatment or wherever they're going next so we've obviously separated out the suicide self-harm so the new section six is all there um, and now we've separated out the section seven which is the family violence so you've got, you want to tick if the um, if you did a risk assessment, one of the, either the brief or the intermediate risk assessment, you're going to tick that. Um, or if it wasn't, if you weren't able to do it today, you'll tick no and you'll, you'll put some notes down here in the detail section as to why. So if the person didn't want to complete that with you today or there was enough time, you're going to make some notes here so that you can follow on with that the next time they come in. Um, did you get to do a safety plan with them? Yes or no? And again, you'll put some details down here. Did you utilise the, the FIS or the SIS? So did you talk about, you know, did you um, request information from another service to help you understand the bigger picture about risk for this client um, or the same for SIS for, for if there are any children in the um, scenario as well? Um, and again, you just want to make sure you put all the details down here. And then if you did do a risk assessment, you would have come up with a level of risk that the client is assessed at. So it requires immediate protection, serious risk, elevated risk or at risk are the levels for the Marin Brief and Intermediate Risk Assessment um, tool. So you will have a description of those in the clinician guide, what constitutes those levels of risk. But of course, I know many of you have been to the, the Brief and Intermediate training. So whether you got to do the face-to-face -face or the webinar, um, it will also be in the e-modules training that's going to come out soon uh, for Brief and Intermediate. Um, and so any safety plan actions um, that you need to make sure kind of follow the client through. So things that either you did or you know that are important for future clinicians to know, just making a note there. Um, and then just at the bottom, if throughout the assessment, even though you're not screening specifically for somebody being a person who uses family violence, they may have disclosed through talking about intervention orders, you may have learned that they are somebody who's used violence. So you just wanna make sure that you put uh, information down here as well. And then you still, all of that obviously is still the same. And that's the end. So I'm gonna stop and just check if there's any questions. Sheridan, we had a question in there about when you might use the brief tool rather than the intermediate tool. And yeah. the guidance on that is that that is when you are time pressured. So we understand that AOD services, especially if it's for when you are short on time. Yeah, and I mean anybody that's used the tool, not used the both the tools, knows there's not a big difference. Anyway, um, so yeah, if you need to be quick, if yeah, if you if you're if you need to be quick for risk assessing, then you'll you'll use the brief. Um, but there really isn't much difference in the in the two different tools anyway. Um, I'm just having a look at the chat box. Uh, okay, yeah, so I've seen that. Uh, <laughs> will they change DHHS to DFF8? <laughs> Good question. I'd forgotten all about that. Um, yes, eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when asking for children's names, it might be helpful to include in brackets, including surname as DHHS needs surnames as well. That's a good, that's actually a really good point. That's true because people do, a lot of the times people will, will record their first names and dates of birth. So that's a, a good point. And we can't assume they have the same surname as a client. Um, so that's a good one. Um, I think, Julia, you said you'll be able to copy and paste these for me. Or if, or if Carmen, could you make a note yep, of that? I'll have a copy of this entire chat log. So I'll be able to pull out any comments or questions so that the panelists can review them afterwards as well. That's great. And that one, I just, I think I do want to keep that on our notes. Um, what is the standard length of time that these additions are going to add to the intake and comprehensive assessment process? Do you want to answer that? I would say it'd be, it'd be variable. And I think we all know that it will depend on the presentation. 
um, that we have in front of us. Um, I think we all care about our clients and I think that uh, we, you know, we want to check in on this stuff. It's hard to say how much time it will take in extra time. I think if we're asking about, um, you know, uh, the whole person and we're, we're thinking about conversational openers, Sheridan, it's, you know, how are things at home can cover a whole range of things, housing, it can cover family violence, it can cover social, social relationships, children, etc. I guess, yeah, it will just depend on, on what comes through. Is that, I mean, is that a reasonable way of uh, sort of explaining the time aspects? I guess that's why there's provision for bridging support, uh, brief interventions. Um, when you when you actually start putting a, a person through for care to counselling, et cetera, you know, if you're coordinating a care team, you might do a CRC, might do a care and recovery. Um, the time that you spend with clients is, we can actually account to it through VADC and through DTAU. So um, the time that you use still will count. So as I said, you can use a bridging support, a brief intervention, a single session family. Um, so those sorts of things you can utilize to count towards your targets. Um, and the other thing that it is going to be, um, that you will start to use it and then and then we will measure the change. So I think that might also address that, that question. That, that That's what I was saying, yeah. Make sure you record whether you've used Marim now. If you have even used the Marim aligned, uh, you know, safety plans, et cetera, within the tools, that still counts as using the Marim framework as well. Um, and the next question is about the intermediate Marim training. So there are still about, I believe there's still a spots available now with the Centre for Excellence. So they had some funding left over from last year. And so they um, rolled out some more webinar based training. So if you go to that, um, and I did put that through Vita e -news a couple of times a few weeks back, but if you get lost, can't find it, just send me an email. But yeah, the Centre for Excellence has got their webinar-based training right now, and I believe there's still spaces that you can you can register now. And it's just left my mind when the e the mm. training is available. Amanda, yeah. end yeah. of end of March. March. So all yep, end of March it'll be online, and everyone can access it in the, at their leisure. E-learning. Yeah, so you'll be able to do it in e-learning, and um, yeah, and so we'll we'll Bada will be sending that out. As soon as that's available, we'll, we'll be communicating that um, to CEO and managers and also Vita e news. Um, sorry if I missed, but when will these new forms? Da, 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 da. So we don't know exactly a day yet, but it looks like Easter. I put my bets on Easter. <laughs> it looks like it'll be out just after Easter. I, I think. Very close, yes. Yeah, it's very close. And it's really just about getting the clinician guide ready to go with it. Um, is there guidance that if serious risk or Sorry, I don't know what this question is saying. Is there guidance that if risk or about non-specialist family violence services must consult? Specialist? I think I can understand what you're saying there. Um, it's Wendy, highly and, recommended. <laughs> absolutely. At any point, any AOD clinician undertaking intake or assessment can consult with someone, their supervisor, their agency, their specialist family violence um, advisor for advice at any time. And it's, it's not specific mm. to say you must consult with this serious risk, but the clinician guidelines are very clear that if you need support making an assessment or making a decision or understanding family violence in a client's life, consult at any time. Seek help and support. I think the other thing to do in preparation, and this is a good prompt, is to make sure that you you understand the relationship you have in the in your local area with your specialist family violence service. So things like understanding what their wait lists look like, uh, what their threshold for taking on clients is, those sorts of things. Um, how you know how they provide their secondary consultation services. You might think about doing a secondary consultation before you see a client, working out um, also what your level is and what you'll do if you feel like you're out of your depth. So those sorts of considerations are things I think we should be thinking about prior um, as well as after we've seen clients. 
Yeah, and I, yeah, so the, the must consult is standing. I don't know if that's a big part of that question, sorry. Yeah, so I think that is, there's no there's no must, as Amanda said, you don't, uh, there's no prescribed, you must uh, consult a specialist family violence service uh, as far as, yeah, it's not mandatory. No, no, and I mean, I know in some but areas. highly recommended. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've been speaking with Safe Steps about their levels of consultation and they're, they're, they're promising me that they will do secondary consults. Um, yes. And I know that some in some regions, people are challenged to work in with their specialist family violence service. Uh, I've heard people talk about them not taking calls and things like that. So, you know, you, you obviously have to look for where you can get support, but also to just say that we're, that we're talking with DV Vic about that as an issue at the moment. Um, Karen, would you say safe steps would be a good one for people wanting a secondary consultation wherever they are in Victoria? Yeah, because it is across Victoria. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, safe steps. Safe steps is a, is a good option. Um, and, you know, like working with your specialist family violence advisors to talk about, I mean, they, they can even support with secondary consult. You know, they could work with you to get that secondary consult. You know, you could really work together, I think, collaboratively. Um, and I've got, does this apply to historical family violence or only current family violence in general with the assessment tools? Um, it's like anything that you, you will hear historical, you know, it's likely the more screening questions um, and the more prompts that open up the discussion about family violence, you will hear more historical family violence. Um, what we're always doing is assessing. So we're assessing risk. So if there's no immediate risk, then you, you're not gonna be doing a risk assessment with them. So if they talk about, if, they, if you ask the screening questions and they say, mm, not at the moment, but you know, like I actually was, you know, in a relationship for 20 years and this is what happened 20 years ago, then you are going to be saying, are you safe? Are you safe today? Are you safe? Are you in any immediate danger? You know, asking those screening questions to assess if there's any risk. And if they say, no, it's all good, you know, like they might share that story of you and it's with you and it's, you know, good to understand. But, um, but if there's no risk, then you, you don't need to do, you don't need to pick up a risk assessment tool. Okay, thanks, that. And I'm just going to interrupt there, Sherrod. And just to clean up a point, Wendy, I can see that you've noted it's in Marum in the chat a little bit further down. And I think you're talking about that must requirement. So when serious risk is indicated, I think you are saying that in Marum, it's saying, yes, you must consult with a specialist family um, violence advisor or a specialist um, family violence worker. Um, okay, thank you for clarifying that. It's not in the clinician guides. It's not a must in the clinician guide. But Wendy, I think what you're clarifying is it's a must in the Marum framework. Is that is that right? Yes, Amanda. Great. All right. So to be clear, it's not a must in the clinician guide. However, it's a must in the Marum framework. So if serious risk is indicated, um, talk to a specialist family violence advisor or worker agency, etc. Sorry, thanks for clearing that up, Wendy. Grateful. Yeah, and thanks, Amanda. Um, and uh, another question from Judith. Uh, it's not a silly question. <laughs> Is there an order, screening, additional module, briefing, intermediate? It will, um, it will, it should mostly flow like that, but there's no, um, and I think when you say screening, I'm not sure if you mean screening as in the intake or, so I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly here. Um, so you're saying number one is screening, number two is additional modules or the brief and intermediate, number three is a safety plan and number four is info sharing. You might find that you're doing safety planning and uh, you might be um, seeking information using the, you know, using the information sharing scheme to seek information as a part of the safety plan. Um, you know, so it really de will depend on the circumstances. For instance, I was uh, supporting somebody recently their secondary consultation and they had a client who was being told that their partner was getting out of prison. So there was things like, you know, trying to find out when was the, the, ex -part, the partner's release date and things like that. So that was a part of the safety planning. So you might find it, it information sharing is really about safety planning. That's, it's been added to make our safety planning effective. So it's all kind of should be happening together, but you know, it, it will depend on the circumstances. Um, 
Uh, right, intermediate assessment or not there. Okay, I think we might have addressed that. Um, the question um, below that about um, using the new screening and assessment tools without specific training in the tools themselves. So no, so that's that's a point of confusion to clear up as well. So um, you shouldn't use the Marin brief and intermediate tools without getting the training, but you can use the screeners and prompts and referrals within the tools themselves. They're designed for sort of, I guess, that low level a skill, um, but everybody should have a look at them and actually sort of ascertain where they're at to, um, for their professional development, but also to sort of get support around them for when they, you know, if it does come up in a session with a client. And um, I, suppose, I suppose that you, this person, I'm not sure, but you might be related, you might also mean the screening and identification. And it's a good point. And I think that, you know, you are now or going to be doing a, this, the MARAM screening and identification because it's in the tool, it's in the comprehensive assessment now, which is why you do need to do the e-module. So I know some people have done that training um, already, but you need to, yeah, you need to do the e-module training when that's released, um, which is the, screen, the MARAM screening and identification training. I think there's been some confusion around what the, and I do think that that has been great communication as well um, around what is the training and what's what and so sometimes people have gotten confused and thought well I don't need to do the screening and identification training like they've thought about it as levels of responsibility as opposed to gaining the skill and using specific tools and, and being able to do the work around using those tools so definitely you want to do the screening and identification e-modules when they're released so um, that will support you to do the um, two what is it 2g section, the new section of the comprehensive as well. Uh, the prescribed training for the sector is Marin Brief and Intermediate, isn't it, Sheridan? Yes, but I'm told that the the new Brief and Intermediate, I think will, on the e-modules, correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda, will that also contain how to use the screening and identification? Yeah, yeah, they're all wrapped up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the screening, screening identification is all wrapped up in the brief and intermediate. So yeah. you don't need to worry necessarily about, you can go to any training you like, any training you think you yeah. need that would support your practice, absolutely. So if you want to go to screening and identification and brief and intermediate, yeah. um, by, by all means do so. But but yeah. the level it's pitched at for the AOD workforce is definitely brief and intermediate. And the current training wraps up the screening and ID training in there. Yeah. And yeah. that's the one you must attend. So if we're talking about what must you do, you must attend the Marin Brief and Intermediate. Mm. So I think it was, it was confusing because there was no training in how to actually use the screening and ID tool previously. So mm. if you're going to different trainings and not actually using any tools originally, like in the training that happened last year. So I just suppose it's a good, this is a good forum to feedback that we gave that feedback and that they received a lot of feedback, uh, the department and I don't know, FSB, I'm not sure now who's in charge of what, but, um, and so the e-module trainings are kind of addressing that where there's, they are using the specific tools. So that's why the screening and ID tool is in the brief and intermediate training and the brief and intermediate immediate risk assessment tools are in the brief and intermediate training. I hope that makes sense. I think there was a lot of confusion because there's a confusion between the training trains in this you will gain these uh, skills and what is the level of responsibility so yeah you want to make sure that you get trained in using the screening and ID tool because that's in the comprehensive assessment and also but that's part of the brief and intermediate training so I, I just want we would just just to be really clear the screening and ID can be done as a separate training, but it's part of the brief and intermediate training. And the one that we, the AOD clinicians need to get to is the brief and intermediate training. Yeah, you can do all of them and I would. They're not very long. They're, they're online, they're self-paced. Um, so I would say to do, to do both of them. Um, and I think that's all the questions. Uh, is the brief and intermediate training the four modules? Yes. Modules. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It'll be three modules when it's in an e-learning um, format, but uh, the Centre for Excellence uh, webinar training is four modules. 
All right. So we've gone through all the questions. It's 11.27, so we've got three minutes to spare. Did anybody, or, or Amanda, I might pass over to you. Did well, you I, can, a... I can just see a comment that from Tracy that we might want to talk to as well. Uh, Tracy saying she's concerned as AOD clinicians were opening up triggers and trauma for people without adequate training. That's a really a, absolutely legitimate concern, Tracy, and, and some of you may share it as well. So seek support from your supervisors, your agency, and your specialist family violence advisors. Um, in managing that, keep that as a live issue uh, for, for yourself and within your organisation so they can respond appropriately. But very good point. There's some great advice from consumers about that as well. So the consumers that we consulted about that have provided some really good feedback as well, which was about sensitive inquiry, sometimes talking about things, the whole issue, sometimes taking more than one session to get into things. Um, and that's incorporated in the clinician guide as well. And those those consumers uh, spoke to exactly, I think that. And and I think going into this um, with eyes wide open, every clinician needs to um, do a bit of an internal audit of their skills, their experience, and and also to remember that their clinical judgment is an important factor in this as well. Um, looking after clients is our first priority, so that's that's what we put at the front of of. of mm thing we do I guess that's, that's how I absolutely that. and as you said Sheridan in the in the minute remaining next steps are standby for uh, the VAD e-news which which will announce these tools are now live go ahead and use them embed them in your practice agencies will be embedding them in their policies and their work they do to support um, AOD workers in the workforce there'll be lots of links to training current training to the turning point um, online guidance those modules that support um, the intake and assessment process um, as well as advice to talk to your specialist family violence advisors as well they're there to support you and your agencies and I guess the big message that we're giving the AOD sector is that you're not expected to be um, experts family violence experts seek advice and support and embedding and implementing these MARAM changes it doesn't have to happen overnight but um, they are statewide and every every service who has contact with a, with a person will be using them so and we're lucky as Sheridan said that we've got these one intake and one assessment tool so we can AOD can pick up on that family violence at the first point of contact with the person and then respond as they need to so thanks all thanks Amanda um, so we'll wrap up, but I just want to um, address a couple of things that come up in by saying your the fact that you've now registered for this. It, um, I'm now getting to keep your email addresses, so we'll also follow up with you with other feedback as well. And some people have kind of said quickly at one thing that link has all the links to trainings and things like that, and that will be a part of the communication that happens when there's the tools are released. So just to say, yeah, that will be happening. Um, but if you just to kind of make you aware that I will be keeping this, the list, all of you that are on, um, on this webinar will will create a list as well to follow up um, as well. So if there's no other questions, we're bang on time. Yeah, okay. Thank you so Thanks much. for the positive feedback in the chat too. It really, um, we really appreciate that as well. Yeah, that's really heartwarming. <laughs> Absolutely. Go forth. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.